Welcome to the official podcast of Comic Spear and Sci-Fi. Brought to you by Crystal Bright Janitorium, The Brand Barbershop, Greco Printing and Imaging, and Able Ideas. Before we get started, make sure to subscribe to this podcast and follow Comic Spear and Sci-Fi on all your favorite social media apps. Now, on with the show! Hey everyone, this is Nick at Motor City Comic Con 2022 with Comic Experience Sci-Fi. I'm here with legendary comic book artist Howard Shaken, and thank you for talking to us, hey, sir. Thanks, Nick. I'm glad to talk to you. We're so glad to see you here. Um, I read a lot of your work during the 70s when I was growing up. When I was a child, too. Exactly. We were both. I, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> sir, tell us, how did your career get started? How, what was your initial interest in art, and then how did you get into comics? You really want me to go back that far? Yes. All sure. right, all right. Absolutely. When I was four years old, the summer of 1955, I had two older cousins who gave me a refrigerator box half filled with every kind of comic book ever made. I climbed into the box, and I had my first, like the Stations of the Cross. It was a transformation like Saul on the Road to Damascus. I realized, A, that somebody made these. B, that I wanted to be one of those people. And within a year, I taught myself to read from comics. My parents, who were idiots, uh, mistook me for a genetic anomaly. They never connected the fact that the comic books were the ones who basically made me who I am today. I had no talent or skill, but I had hunger and blind rage. That hunger and blind rage informed me until I learned skills about 10 years into my career. First 10 years of my career was a mistake and a mess. Then I got good when I was 30. Now I'm 71, and I'm still working. Okay. Um, now, uh, you apprenticed, you consider Gil Kane to My be first your, mentor. your first mentor. Tell us, how did you uh, make the acquaintance of Gil Kane? Gil, I, I heard through the grapevine that Gil's assistant had died in his sleep, and because I had the callousness of youth, I called up and said, hey, I heard your guy's dead, you need somebody. Because that's what, sh sh what shitheads of 19 do. <laughs> what year was that? I was 69. 60, yeah, so he was, uh, was he still at Marvel at that time? I don't know, who, no, he was doing Black Mark at that point. Okay. Uh, for Cigna, and um, he was, I think he was doing occasional freelance for Julie at DC. Okay. Um, Julia and, Schwartz. And, and, but he was ashamed to send me to deliver work, because I, my, I, he felt that my physical presentation, I had hair down on my shoulders, right. I dressed like an urban cowboy like all of us did, misrepresented him and his interests, because he of course was the Brooks Brothers guy from the, from the nose down. Um, but yeah, I mean, I learned everything I know from Gil Kane. Okay, and what was your first regular comic book assignment? I got the sword and sorcery job with, D with DC because they demonstrated to Denny that I was willing to work my ass off for a job, and I did. It wasn't very good, I didn't know what I was doing, and I'm still living down that, 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 that period of my life, but it really wasn't until I was away from comics in the late 70s that I learned craft and technique and respect for both of those things. And when I came back to comics in the early 80s with American Flag, I... I was able to put together an actual professional commitment to professional work, and it's never been any different since. Okay, um, if I could just backtrack a little bit, how did you uh, become involved with Marvel? I don't remember, I honestly don't, I really don't okay. recall. Yeah. Um, Marvel had no interest in us, I mean, you have to remember that when, when, when I came into the business, Marvel was all about Stan and a bunch of guys our father's age. You know, who stand like to smoke and drink with, and you know, and, and you know, whatever. They, comic books were drawn, Marvel books were done by guys in their 40s, and they didn't care about us. The only guy, member of my generation, who landed ready to go was Buckler. And uh, when, when when Roy moved in, Roy was the one who started bringing, bringing younger guys in. So I have no recollection whatsoever of why and how I ended up at Marvel. I've never, I mean, I, I freelance for them, and I've never been on the inside loop at Marvel the way I was, say, at DC. I was because I had, I was rabbi at DC by Joe Orlando. And so I got a lot of the inside workings there, which I never did at Marvel. I was always a, I was a side guy, I you know. I mean, I, I run into guys now, you know, in their 60s and, and late 50s and 60s that I, that, that I worked with then that I barely remember having anything to do with. Um, so Marvel was never a big part of my experience. You know? Okay, well, whether you like it or not, it was a big part of our experience, you being at Marvel, because you drew the original Star Wars I did. adaptation. I did. How did that come about? Um, George Lucas asked me to draw it. I think he expected better work than I delivered. Um, I, had I known it was going to be as big a deal, had I known it was going to be the source of what has become a secular religion, I always thought it was going to be Elvis. That was what I expected the secular religion to be, but yeah. it turned out to be Star Wars. 
Um, and, um, and, and, and it's a source of enormous bitterness in my life. I see. Well, I don't think you do. Well, <laughs> how exactly? Um, now we were we were discussing earlier, like when you drew Job of the Hut, you drew him as sort of a humanoid figure. Yeah, because which, I, which, I had the special effects have not been done yet. Well, the did you had you seen any footage, or did you have to go by production no. drawings? I broke the script down into six issues. The first time Roy saw anything of text was when he saw my artwork delivered. He wrote from my breakdown. Um, I had the McQuarrie paintings. And I had 40, 40, 400 stills, which okay. all looked like like IKEA in space. Okay. And um, you know that that was it. I had no idea what Jabba the Hutt looked like. You know, there was no indication of the script that he looked like uh, like you know like like Mr. Happy. You know, uh, nothing. In the original footage, he was a guy in a just a regular human character. They made him a slug in you're, you're, the third you're one. You're me for someone who cares. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so. In just a couple weeks, we lost a couple of the greats, George Perez and Neil Adams. How well did you know them? Neil was my, was my second major mentor. Okay. Um, I, when, when Neil died, I posted the fact that, you know, he and I hadn't had a real relationship since the late 1970s, but that I owe my career to him. Uh, he was the one who got me my first job at DC Comics. He basically strong-armed people to give me work that I wasn't worthy to get. And, um, and I, I learned a great deal working for Neil, both with Neil and for Neil, which is... And some of the things unlearn, some of them learn. George, I barely knew. Okay. I, I didn't know him at all. I mean, you know, we were of a different generation, only by a couple of years, but of different interests. I ran into him at conventions. We we, we ate once together. But, you know, I had no idea who he was. Um, and you know, he and he and he was in service to work that I didn't care about at all. I see. Um, I mean, for me, Neil. Someone posted recently about the idea of not, now that now, they'd love to see someone collect the Ben Casey scripts. I would love to see someone collect all of his pre-comic book work. Uh, I'd like to see the Ben Casey stuff. I'd like to see all the work that he did for General Electric. Uh, all that Johnstone and Cushing stuff. Because that stuff is brilliant work. It really is. I mean, Gil Kane once dismissed Neil as making comic books safe for commercial art, which was seeing it through the perspective of a guy who's, who identified comics as, as solely being derived from Jack Kirby and Will Eisner. And Neil really did introduce... Uh, the, the, the magic realism of newspaper strips into comic books with a dynamism that we'd never seen before. You guys don't remember, because you weren't around, but there was enormous hostility to his work when it first appeared. Interesting. Because it was so odd and so off-putting by comparison to what had been the staid look of Kurt Swan and Murphy Anderson. Um, it took a year or so for people to come become accustomed to the, the energy level that, that he put forth in this work. Um, I mean, I met him when I was... 17, maybe 18, um, and 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 I and I was I had no my work was terrible, um, and he let me know this, um, but he was someone with a profound commitment. I mean, a, a near sociopathic commitment to the work. I mean, he had no life other than the work, um, and he was a complex and contradictory guy, um, and we disagreed on, on as many things as we agreed on, but. You know, I mean, I stand on the shoulders of five men. You know, Gil Kane, Neil Adams, Gray Morrow, Wallace Wood, and Joe Orlando. Everything I know about comics, I learned from those five guys. And the and I, I, I cannot even begin to imagine having had the career that I've had uh, without the influence of those men. And, Gil, and Neil was the last of those five guys. What was Wallace Wood's influence on you? To a great extent, it was cautionary. I mean, uh, when I met Woody, he was he was uh, toward, you know, careening toward the end of his life. He was, I met him about ten years before he died. Yeah. No, about five years before he died. Not ten years. And he was a difficult, disillusioned, and angry guy. But the work, I, I, right now, as a cartoonist, visually speaking, the three things I seek in my work are. The, the, the graphics of Alex Toth, the verisimilitude of Wallace Wood, and the textual simplicity of, jo of John Severin. And, and Woody's work remains a major part of my daily experience. Um, but, you know, I, I, I worked with him very briefly. Most of what I came away from working with him was meeting Jack Abel, who was not a particularly interesting artist and one of the best people I've ever known in my life. Uh, I was his henchman, and, uh, and we, were, we misbehaved together. He was, you know, my father's age, but, you know, I. I, I made sure it come out of his nose. 
know. One more question. You mentioned you're still working. What are you working on these days? Well, let's see. I've just finished a six-issue miniseries working with the fabulous Mark Guggenheim, an espionage thriller, which will be out at the end of the year. I'm working on the last chapter of a crime book, that I'm, a crime series that I'm doing a second chapter of, a second part of, for a new website called Neotext, which is really worth visiting for those of you interested in this, what we're talking about. Neotext is a great website to visit. I'm halfway through the script of, the, of, the, of Hey Kids Volume 3, which is about fandom. It's subtitled The Shellac of the New. I've got the first draft written of the sequel to The Divided States of Hysteria, which may or may not ever see public see print, because the audience is extremely hostile to that aspect of my career, and they can go to hell. <laughs> Howard, thanks so much for talking pleasure, to us. It's, it's been a great pleasure great meeting you. you thank well. you, sir. You know, be well, don't make yourself crazy. Okay, thank you. Thanks, guys. Hey everybody, it's Nick with Comic Experience Sci-Fi at Motor City Comic Con, and I'm here talking to Roy Schwartz. Roy is the author of this book, is Superman Circumcised, The Jewish History of Superman. Okay, Stan Lee, real name Stanley Martin Lieber, Jack Kirby, artist, Bob Kane, creator of Batman, Jerry Siegel, Joel Schuster, creators of Superman, all Jewish. Is there something Jewish about the idea of a superhero in and of itself? Yeah, yeah. So the comic book medium is a Jewish invention. The superhero genre is a Jewish invention. The Comic-Con is a Jewish invention. Um, this can all be traced, just like jazz and African Americans, comic books can be traced to a very specific group of Jews in New York in the 30s and 40s. Uh, it was a depression. They couldn't get a job doing anything else. All the respectable businesses were close to them. So they created an industry of their own, which is like the history of Hollywood, right? Uh, and into their, into their creations, aside from the historical context, they imbued them with Jewish signification. They put a lot of their Jew and a lot of their culture in these creations. An easy example is we look at Superman, and if you think of Superman's um, origin story as an infant sent from Krypton, found by people not his own, and raised, that's the origin story of Moses. That's baby Moses. And that's like a very easy, simple example to give, but there are hundreds more. Okay, Jesus, also a Jew. Famous one, yeah more or less a, a demigod, mother was a human, sure. father was a spirit, uh, sent to earth by a father to be a light to the human race. If you go by uh, Brando's dialogue in the first Superman film, is Jesus the first superhero? Or would Moses or David be, are they superheroes? Yes to all, right? Superman is also very much Jesus. They can be a great people, Kalel, they wish to be. They only like the light to show the way. Yes. For this reason above all, their capacity for good, I've sent them you, my only son. There you go. Not that I've seen it too many times or anything. Right. But I, I, I could have done it myself. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so there's absolutely that. But those layers, the, the Christological layers were added in later years. And it's all good. This is not some like bragging rights or ownership. It's about recognizing contribution. Um, it all comes back to the same sources. It calls it the same place in the world, right? Yes. Um, and yes, uh, Jesus is sort of like the prototypical superhero. And before him, we have King David. And King David is this scrawny youth who nobody took seriously. There was this big enemy from the East Goliath coming. He picked up a star-spangled shield and went to fight him. That's Captain America, 2,800 years before, right? <laughs> um, right. And that Jack Kirby, as a little artist from the Lower East Side, creates another little artist from the Lower East Side who picks up that shield. Right. So it all kind of ties together. Uh, and we have Moses, who, from a literary perspective, we look at, the, at scripture just as works of literature, he is a prototype of Jesus. They have so many of these parallel stories from their origin, right? You have the massacre of the innocents and the Bethlehem and going to Egypt, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So it all comes back to scripture as this source that the creators drew upon, sometimes consciously, sometimes not consciously, depending which of the creators you ask. Um, and you can really trace the history of comic books uh, step in step with Jewish American history of the early 20th century. Okay, what about the concept of the secret identity? Now, I've, I've read over the years that Jewish people often, of course, had to change their names. They had to hide their real identity um, and not really be themselves, if you will. But their real selves, of course, are these wonderful people like Superman or Batman, but they have to kind of be these subdued, mild-mannered characters. Is there something Jewish about the concept of the secret identity? I really think there is. And there were secret identities before Superman, but they were just a matter of convenience. I have a mask on, nobody knows who I am. But they weren't aspects of identity. 
Think about it. Superman as a Kryptonian passing for an Earthling. When right. he transforms from Clark Kent to Superman, it's not just the personal, it's the ethnic as well. Right? He's a one-man ethnicity. Right? Yes. And it's hard maybe for uh, younger viewers today to realize in the age of identity politics and pride of where you are and where you came from, this didn't used to be the case. You know, the, the standard was WASP and the thing to do was to pass. So you have Kal El, born with a Hebraic name. El means God in Hebrew. He comes over from the old country, Krypton, right? He changes his name to Clark Kent. Michael Shabon said only a Jew would come up with that waspy name, right? Uh, and he passes. And every time, at any given moment, he can decide which aspect of himself, personally and uh, ethnically, can interact with the world. And that's exactly what they did. Stanley Martin Lieber, Stan Lee, Jacob Kurtzberg, Jack Kirby. Right. Um, the Schusterowicz family became Schuster. The Segalowicz family became Siegel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so very much they drew upon what they knew and what they understood to imbue the secret identity with meaning, which didn't exist before Superman. That's great. Uh, where can people get your book if they're not able to make it to Comic-Con this weekend? So it will be offered through the Detroit uh, Jewish Book Fair, which is wonderful and has all kinds of uh, comic books and related things. It's sold everywhere. Books are sold, any bookstore, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. But if you want it signed, Comic-Con is where it's at. Thanks a lot, Roy. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey everybody, it's Nick with Comic Experience Sci-Fi. Very excited to be here in Novi, Michigan at the Motor City Comic Con. Great to be back in business here. And I'm at the Joe Kubert Art School. You're close, you're nailing it, don't worry. It's okay. okay. <laughs> you, sir, are the president of the school. Yes, yes, and what is the actual name of the school? So the Joe Kubert School of Cartoon and Graphic Art. And uh, it's a wonderful three-year program that specializes in cartoon and graphic art, where namely comic books, storytelling, narrative art, uh, graphic design, all those wonderful things that we all take for granted. So it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful school. Okay, I got a lot of questions for you. First of all, can you tell our viewers what does the name Qbert mean in the comic book industry? Well, when you say legacy, I think that that's the best way to start about it. Uh, you know, Joe Kubert, if you don't know, was an incredible artist, one of the Mount Rushmore artists of the comic book industry. And he founded the school out of a need. Everywhere he was going, he was finding different people that wanted to work in this industry, that wanted to break in. And he realized, you know what? Why don't we start something where people can come and learn this craft? So this way they can go out there and start doing this professionally. And he founded the Joe Kubert School. And then next thing you know, he started off with about 20-something students in what we call the mansion, which is actually where the students live now in the dorms. Okay. And then from there, he wound up purchasing the current building that the school is in and turned it into the full-time program that it is. What year was the school founded? When did he open the school? 1976 was when the school was founded. Okay, now, and you're, correct me if I'm wrong, but in 1976, people like me were using how to draw comics the Marvel way as our template for drawing. And I'm sure that drawing with pencils and ink is how things of course started. How has this art form evolved? Uh, is it still drawing things with pencils? Is it on computer? What is it like now to do comic book art? It's a wonderful mix of both. Okay. You know, I always tell everyone whether you're drawing with a pencil or if you're drawing with a computer using a different program, your Cintiq, whatever it is that you're using, you still need to know how to draw. Right. Okay, because whether it's a pencil or a tool, it's still just a tool. You have to know how to draw. And that's what we do so well at the Kubert School, is we build upon the foundation that Joe started, and we continue to teach, keep things up to date with what's going on, so the students are exposed to that. So, so they're working with those programs that are out there. So we're using everything that you could think of that they need to know to be in this industry, working in the different production tools, whatever that's out there. And so we just keep on building upon it. But it all comes down to learning how to draw the proper way, how to tell a story with your art. And that's what we do so well. And how do the students do once they leave school? They do really well. What we love to do at our school is we actually set it up so that in the third year, it's a three-year school, we bring in about 15 different companies. And then what they do is they do portfolio reviews and they actually go through all the different students in our third year and they start cherry picking the students to go out and start working. We've also set up different things, different initiatives this year at the school where now we have uh, Pixar coming out and they're actually teaching across all three years and that's how Pixar goes out and starts hiring different people, bringing in interns. So this is a really huge thing for us and we're something that we're very proud of. That's awesome. And this kind of leads me into my next question is, besides comic books themselves, what other sort of career paths could your graduates take? Sure. You can go into production work, you can go into storyboarding, you can go into editorial, you can go into all the different facets of comic book making. 
the possibilities are limitless. You can go into anything. It all comes down to storytelling. Exactly what you're doing right now is you're telling a story. So we teach that at the school and hopefully the students go out there and find something that makes them happy and continue to do it. Very cool. So now, who are some of your favorite artistic influences in comics? Oh man, I mean, of course you got to say Joe Kubert. He's yes. right at the top. Yeah, sure. But then, you know, when I was a kid, I loved Dan Jurgens, Jerry Ordway. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. Darwin Cook, you know, Bruce Tim. How can you not love all those guys, sure. right? I'm an old man, so for me it's George Perez, oh, George Perez John Romita, John Buscema, you know, Steve Ditko, Jack Kirby, of course. But I know you guys love those guys. But here's a question I have. This is a little pet peeve, I guess, to put it, you know, not too nicely. I, but when I look at art today, a lot of the comic book art you see, it looks great as a single panel. What about action? The way the uh, comic books I grew up with, it, the action and the fight scenes were always very well choreographed. But then when I'd look at a Jim Lee Spider-Man, the fight scenes weren't so good, but if the picture of Mary Jane in a bikini was great, you know? So how do you guys teach drawing action and movement? It has to make sense to the story, you know? So no matter what, when we go and we do a page, or any of these artists that are here in Artist Alley that are working on interiors, the story has to come first. You can't just go in there and slap in a splash page if there's no need for a splash page. Sure. So if it makes sense to the story, it should be in there. Have something dynamic. Push it. Foreshortening is key. That'll make everything seem way more dynamic than it ever needed to be. So it's really up to the artist to really understand the fundamentals of the drawing and how to apply it into the story to make sense yeah. with the story. Okay. And then it'll be perfectly fine. OK, last question. Um, in the old days, lots of panels per page. Mm -hmm. As time went on, sometimes you'd have just a giant, again, Jim Lee shot on a page, and there seemed to be a little bit less story. Is that addressed at all at the school? Uh, X amount of panels per comic, or just you know, depending on the style of the authors themselves? It really depends on who you're working with. Okay. I mean, that's just the truth. You know, there's some writers that want to have a lot of panels on a page. There's some writers that might want to limit it down to like just six. Uh, it really just depends on who's writing your story. But it's also up to you as the artist to be able to have a conversation with the writer at times to be like, you know what, I think we could change something here and make it even more impactful. Okay. And this page on a stronger cliffhanger. And so whenever anybody talks about comic book art, you have to realize comics are the ultimate collaboration. Right. It's not just one person. You've got editors involved, you've got production people, you've they're got cinematic. writers, there's artists, yeah. there's inkers. You know, if technically you're looking the last person's art is really the inker. Right. So, you know, you got the inkers, the letters, the letterer has to be a storyteller. So it's so many people involved. And so you all have to be able to have a conversation and hopefully be able to put out the best possible product under a very tight deadline. That sounds great, guys. Really appreciate you talking to us. Again, this is Nick with the Kubert School at uh, Motor City Comic Con 2021. Thanks, guys. That's it for this episode of the Comics Beer and Sci-Fi Podcast. Thank you for listening, and we hope you'll join us next time.